The Hari Nam Chintamani is about the uh, process and importance of chanting the holy name, and particularly Hari Das Thakur, in the uh, latter chapters of the Hari Nam Chintamani, discusses offenses against the holy name. We've said that in the age of Kali Yuga, the chanting of the holy name is the most important uh, of all the uh, processes of uh, Krishna consciousness. It's more important than any other process that we have. Because The holy name actually is more than any of the other Vedic um, regulations. We'll be talking about that today. Um, there are ten offenses against chanting the holy name of the Lord, and today I want to talk about two of them. One of them is the offense of considering the holy name to be the same as ritualistic activities offered in the Vedas as fruitive activity, technically called Subha Karma. Subha Karma is the uh, process of doing good karma. And what fits into the category of Subha Karma? Taking vows engaging in tapasya, having someone do a fire sacrifice, propitiating various demigods, studying Vedic literature, engaging in yoga, performing the meditation practice, um, engaging in various kinds of uh, philosophical um, conversations and debates, uh, fasting, charity. All these things are mentioned in various parts of the Vedas. And all these things fall under the category of Subha karma, which is good karma. They will help one. But the process of chanting the holy name is in no way equal to these things. The process of the holy name is the Yuga Dharma. It is beyond what uh, these other processes uh, discuss. So the process of chanting the holy name can erase all the unwanted things in the heart. We have so many um, undesirable uh, things in the heart. And when we come to Krishna consciousness, just by chanting, those undesirable things in the heart gradually get destroyed. It doesn't happen all at once, but very quickly, those very unwanted, undesirable things in the heart become uh, erased. But as we spoke about yesterday in the Brooklyn Temple, I was there, and we were discussing the um, offenses before this one, uh, we find out that uh, the process of chanting uh, releases us from what we call sinful reaction. So when we chant the holy name, we may have committed many different sinful activities. But the process of the holy name removes the reaction that's in process heading towards us from having committed sinful activities. But that's not the whole be-all and end-all of sinful uh, karma and how it works. More important even than that is the fact that 
uh, when we commit a sinful activity, one of the punishments for committing a sinful activity is we get the desire to perform that same sinful activity a second time and a third time and a fourth time. And of course, this is the, me uh, the mechanism that we commonly know in our modern world as addiction. We get addicted to various kinds of sinful activity. A child smokes a cigarette and, you know, he's uh, happy that nobody found out he went somewhere secret and smoked a cigarette, but he gets the desire to smoke another cigarette. And right now it's only psychological, but a little ways further down the road, he's smoking two packs a day and he's 10 years older and his health is going down the tubes and he can't stop smoking. And uh, this is the process of um, uh, sinful uh, desires becoming habitual. So we can get rid of sinful reaction, but unless we're careful, we just make the same mistake over and over and over again, which is, um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday in the Brooklyn Temple, the idea of the elephant bath. That an elephant um, goes to the water to take a bath, and dives in and after the elephant gets out of the water it comes up on land the first thing the elephant does is throw dirt on itself so you think why did the elephant take a bath if the first thing the elephant does when it comes out of the water is throw dirt on itself excuse me of course um, we find out that uh, biologists tell us that elephants are sensitive to ultraviolet light so they put dirt on themselves, it's the elephant's version of suntan lotion. So, <laughs> uh, rather, you know, we usually don't think of an elephant's skin as being tender or that they need protection from something. They seem like tanks or something like that to us. But evidently for the elephant, the elephant has to put some dirt on itself so that it covers itself from the uh, rays of the sun. And so the first thing the elephant does after getting out of the water is to throw dirt on itself and it's called the elephant dirt bath. So we find out that people engage in sinful activities, they uh, find some process of atonement, and once again they commit the same sinful activity, and once again they commit, uh, they engage in atonement, and then they commit the sinful activity, and then they engage in the atonement. So we see that this elephant bath situation is not really a sensible thing. Uh, we want to know not just how to get rid of our sinful reaction, but we want to break the cycle of sinning again and again because we're still addicted to the same sinful thing. Now, even more than that, there's something called the odor of past sinful habits. There are more subtle things in the consciousness. There's the original material desire that brought us to the material world, what we wanted to do here. There is the tendency to see things in the wrong way. And all these things are part of the mess that we get into when we engage in sinful activities. And everyone in the material world will engage in sinful activities unless they're a pure devotee. And if they're a pure devotee, they're likely not here to begin with. You know, So people who come here aren't pure devotees, so everybody that's here is uh, tangled up in the fallen vines of all these different things. Reactions to sins, habitual sins, the desire for material uh, happiness, and misunderstanding, ignorance of the material world, of what it really is. All these things contribute to the mess that people are in. And the Vedas prescribe many different things to deal with this, as we've been saying. Uh, we read in the uh, f four major Vedas, the Rig, Sama, Atarva, and Yajur Veda, we find out about sacrifices. What we perform various sacrifices for demigods. We perform various other kinds of rituals for auspicious home life, for a new home, for uh, children to grow up, for uh, freedom from ghosts and other unwanted things, from, uh, for good crops and so many other kinds of things. This is Suva Karma. It's designed to help us to get by in the material world so we can be happy in the material world. And so these activities give us 
a material result. Uh, the holy name, the end and the means are the same thing. Why are we chanting the holy name? So that we can associate with Krishna. But Krishna is the holy name. So we are chanting the holy name so that as we get more purified, we will chant the holy name better. And when we go back to the spiritual world, we don't say, oh, now I'm, I can throw my bead bag away. I'm finished with the holy name. What's everybody doing in the spiritual world? They're chanting the holy name. So um, the end and the means are the same thing. Uh, we at no stage will give up chanting the holy name once we've started the process of Krishna consciousness. We don't chant until we get past a certain threshold and then we no longer have to chant anymore. Uh, the person who chants actually opens their connection to Krishna and since Krishna is absolute, that means that Krishna's name, fame, abode, pastimes, qualities, they are all one. They are not different things. Uh, when we talk about water, the word water, and the actual thing water, we see that they're two different things. If I'm uh, dying of thirst in the desert and I go water, 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 I don't quench my thirst because the word and the thing water are different things. But if I chant Krishna, Krishna's right there. Provided, of course, that I chant very sincerely and I chant without offenses and I chant without all the other unwanted things. We talked about earlier that chanting means we have to be free from the cloud of anarta, which is asat trishna hridaya dorbalyam and something called aparad. So uh, asat trishna is the thirst for material things Hridaya Dharvalyam is what we just talked about. The weakness and tendency to commit the same old sinful reactions over, uh, sinful actions over and over again. So we tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. Why? Because part of the way sinful reactions are set up is that they cause us to do the same thing over and over again. It's mentioned in the Nectar of Devotion that there is the what's called the bija stage of sinful desire. There's the kutasta stage. There is what's called the parabda and the aparabda stage of uh, sinful reactions. Parabda stage means sinful reactions are hitting us. The boy who was sneaking a smoke out behind the house uh, has been told by his doctor that he has lung cancer. So at this point, the sinful reaction is no longer uh, waiting to come into his life. The sinful reaction has arrived and now he has to face the consequences of that sinful reaction. That's called parabda karma. Aparabda karma is that sinful reaction hasn't happened quite yet. It's getting close. It's out there somewhere and it's waiting like a boomerang to finally make its way fully back around to us. And so the bija and the kuta sta stage are where we uh, uh, perform a sinful reaction and then we get the seed or the desire to perform that sinful reaction again, a sinful action again. And so we repeat sinful action and of course as we repeat it, the reaction gets worse and we get the desire more intensely to repeat it more and more. We never get tired of sinning. We never get tired of doing the wrong thing because we're addicted to it. And uh, that's why the material world just kind of like a whirlpool sucks people down to the bottom. Unless we have some process to lift us up. And that's what the holy name does. So if we put our faith in various yagyas, in performing sacrifices, we get pundits and we have them perform sacrifices for us, we will not be purified in the long run. If we put our faith in studying various Vedic scriptures and uh, arguing about what the Supreme Lord is and how we can understand it or what method is better, we will not be delivered from this downward whirlpool.
If we perform various tapas or we perform various uh, austerities, we fast, we uh, go without moving, we stop speaking, we uh, engage in some kind of crazy austerity where we stand in one place under a tree, or uh, we go out to the desert and we start fires and we sit in the middle of the fires in the middle of the desert, or we go to the Himalayas and we go into the water where the water is just coming out of the glacier and it's basically almost ice and we stand in the neck in that water. We perform those things, we will also not be free from the material world because the end and the means are not the same thing. If we are performing austerities, we're standing in uh, cold water or we're in the middle of fires, when we go back to the spiritual world, nobody will be standing in cold water or getting involved in fires. Uh, if we're uh, performing yagyas for various demigods, when we go back to the spiritual world, we will see that nobody there is performing yagyas for various demigods. We will see that in the spiritual world, nobody is performing yoga meditation. Nobody is studying Vedic scriptures and arguing about the meaning of those Vedic scriptures. We see these things are not going on in the spiritual world. So, chanting the holy name is going on in the spiritual world, and other processes of devotion are going on. There's nine processes of devotion. Hearing, chanting, remembering, serving, offering prayers, offering puja, remembering Krishna, um, becoming a servant, becoming a friend, and giving up everything for Krishna. These things are going on in the spiritual world. The nine processes of devotion are directly connected to the spiritual world. But the other Vedic processes are not. And therefore they are called Shubha Karma. They're in a different category. And you can perform Shubha Karma, but the idea of Shubha Karma is to get you to the state where one day you will realize the pointlessness of Shubha Karma and you will perform genuine bhakti. You will stop performing Shubha Karma. So Shubha Karma brings you to a certain threshold and then you do leave Shubha Karma behind. You do leave behind these uh, activities of uh, Vedic regulation. And you transfer yourself to what? You become pure bhakti. So if you're already performing pure bhakti, there is no reason in the world to go back to Shubha Karma or to involve yourself in, in these activities of Shubha Karma. Of course, yes, sometimes we give in charity, sometimes we do fire sacrifices, but we know these are, as it's called in Haranam Talmud, secondary processes. They are not the most important. They are not even essential. What is essential is performing devotional service, the nine processes, especially chanting the holy name. The holy name has its special characteristic. It is called the Yuga Dharma. So in this age of Kali Yuga, this is the uh, only way to get out of the material world. Uh, but it has to be performed in a very thoughtful way. It cannot be performed um, in a way that's distracted or a way that is, um, we have a wrong conception of it. And so we hear that the holy name can deliver anyone, but we also hear that the holy name has to be given by the spiritual master. But we also hear that even the holy name doesn't wait for initiation. So how are we to understand these things? The answer is that the holy name will purify us and the holy name starts the minute we chant it. Even, as we said before, people chant the holy name not necessarily because they know it's the holy name. So there's Hela, or chanting the holy name neglectfully. There's uh, Smita, chanting the holy name in a joke. You know, we say, oh, look at those funny Hare Krishnas. So, or we make some uh, joke about it. This is also chanting the holy name. There's also Stoba, where we chant the holy name in a derisive mood. All oh, those Hare Krishnas, somebody should put them all in a concentration camp somewhere. <laughs> you know, we have a negative um, concept of the holy name.
and there's something called sanketa, which means uh, to chant the holy name, meaning something else. Like um, the lady who sits at the front desk will say, Ramada in, uh, can I help you? But she's just chanted the holy name because Rama is in Ramada in. So because it happens that she works for Ramada in, she is chanting the holy name all day long. She has to say, Ramada in, can I help you? Oh, yes, we can book that room. Uh, that room is free today. What else, can I help you with anything more? Uh, do you need any car service with that? You know, so she is chanting all day long and uh, she's making benefits. So is somebody that uh, Bindu calls his comp company Computerama. So there again, you've got the holy name or you've got uh, so many things which might have the holy name in it. And we talked about before that if there's syllables in between the holy name, then it doesn't work anymore. So we had uh, Haridas Thakur uses the word hatikari. So it starts out with ha and it ends with ri, but the in between there's these syllables tika, so hatikari. So because the syllables tika are in between ha and ri, excuse me, you don't get the benefit of the holy name then. But if somebody you know has some name. Uh, I, one, one year, I was out, we were uh, going in a van, and we were going all over the country. And uh, we were, at that time, selling record albums out of the van. You know, we were giving people albums and asking them to give donations and so on and so forth. And um, there was a young man somewhere in Arkansas or something, we were out in the middle of the country, and his name was Harry Krishner. <laughs> I couldn't believe it that that was really his name, you know. His name was Harry Krishner. <laughs> and I thought, what a name, you know. <laughs> Somehow or other, this guy, this guy and his whole family have gotten benedicted, you know. I, I'd never realized that before. You know? I never ran into anybody that had a name that was that close, you know. I talked about that for a while because it just stuck in my mind. He was just a, you know, a country kid, you know, and I guess he was, his family's name was Kirshner, and uh, his, hap his happened to be Harry, so. <laughs> and so, any rate, we see that even accidentally chanting the holy name, uh, no, I'm okay now, accidentally chanting the holy name, chanting the holy name uh, in an angry or negative mood, chanting the holy name in a joking mood, chanting the holy name uh, uh, negligently, all these things, still we are in contact with the holy name because Krishna is non-different than his name. And we see that the cloud of anartha is because we thirst for material things, we have these bad habits, and we commit aparats. So what we're learning now is these aparats because just to continue chanting, even if we're chanting in namabhas or negligently to some extent, we will eventually erase the bad effects of wanting asat trishna or having thirst for material things. We will eventually erase the tendency to sin over and over again, hridaya dor volume, but we will not erase aparats. That we have to actually make an effort to change. We have to make a, a specific effort to remove aparad. And so the aparad we're talking about today is uh, the one that we usually count as the eighth aparad in the ten offenses, which is uh, the one to um, consider the chanting of Hare Krishna as one of the auspicious ritualistic activities offered in the Vedas as fruitive activity, karma conduct. So this is a, an offense. And the reason I talked about all these Vedic um, processes, Krishna talks about them in the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, and then he gets around to telling Krishna he wants him to be a bhakti yogi. And similarly, Haridas Thakur, when he speaks to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the um, Harinam Chintamani, also describes all these different processes and how they are secondary processes and they will not bring one 
to love Krishna and to get out of the material world. So in fact they're material processes. They offer a material solution and give us material benediction. But they do not offer us love of Godhead, which is what we really need to get out of the material world. So these are secondary processes, they're called Shubha Karma. And the end and the means is different. In Shubha Karma, you are doing something but you have an objective in mind. Usually when people perform sacrifices they want to become rich, they want to become happy, they want their children to prosper, they want to get a new good wife or a good husband, they want to have their crops uh, succeed. All these are various material benedictions. Sometimes people want to get free from sinful action and they perform what we call prayas chitta. These again are things that have a material goal at their center. And we find out that sometimes people perform charity, they don't know why they're giving in charity, and they don't know who is a proper recipient of charity. Uh, and sometimes we see people perform austerities, usually to gain some mystic power. Sometimes people perform meditation or yoga processes, again, to gain some mystic power. So these processes, all of them listed in the Vedas, are in no way in the same category as chanting the holy name. And if we're chanting the holy name, we're struggling to hear the holy name, we will automatically be delivered by the holy name. We do not need to resort to these other processes. And we see that when Prabhupada actually explained the process of Krishna consciousness, we find that he did not introduce a lot of these Vedic things that you see in India, you know, we don't see that Prabhupada encouraged people to go on long fasts. We don't see that Prabhupada encouraged people to take vows of mona or silence. We don't see that Prabhupada encouraged all these various Vedic um, demigod special days where cer certain things are done for various demigods. We see that Prabhupada didn't encourage any of these things. Because if one is performing bhakti yoga, there is no need to perform these secondary processes of subha karma. And in the beginning, we may not have faith that that actually is true. But if we continue, as Haridas Thakur says, the most important thing is to associate with devotees. If we associate with devotees, we see that they have no emphasis on these secondary Subha Karma Vedic processes. All their emphasis is on chanting and performing devotional service. And we see that they develop a taste for chanting. So Haridas Thakur mentions <coughs> that when chanting the holy name, he quotes a verse from the Chaitanya Bhagavat, the Madhya Lila, you know, somewhere uh, in, I forget, um, the 12th chapter, you know, 600th verse or something like that, uh, where Lord Chaitanya tells everybody, he says, chant this mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Chant it and make it a daily vow. And uh, that's where we get the word nirbanda, uh, the daily vow, nirbanda. We take a vow to chant a certain quantity of japa or repetitions of the holy name every day. So in Lord Chaitanya's time, uh, the idea was that one could chant um, 108. Of course, we have a string of mala now that we uh, recognize as 108. I believe at the time when Lord Chaitanya was around, people chanted on their fingers. But you can do that also. See, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And over here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So if you multiply 9 times 12, you come up with 108. So what you do is you chant all the way through like this, and then you move this finger. You know, you kind of get the idea right, but it, it, it takes some concentration to be able to do that. You're also trying to remember the holy name. So the idea of devotees chanting segued, uh, I think, very soon into the idea of using beads. And there's 108 beads on a string. So when you go around the 108 beads, one time, two times, 
three times, four times, that's called a grunty. And so Lord Chaitanya's followers used to chant 16 grunties, not 16 rounds. They chanted 16 grunties. And of course, if you do the math, that's 64 rounds. So that's why Bhakti Siddhanta and others recommended 64 rounds. But then you had people like Haridas Thakur that went beyond that to chanting three lakhs of rounds every day, which is, I did the math on that the other day, about 173 rounds <laughs> every day. Um, the way that we usually chant, essentially you have about 15 minutes in a 24-hour day to, uh, that you could do something else. <laughs> Essentially, you're chanting all day. Of course, that's the whole idea. <clears throat> now, how could someone chant all day long if they were not actually getting some deep spiritual connection there? Obviously, you could not. If I sat somewhere and just said Coca-Cola, 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 I could do that, but I would just get bored out of my mind. After a while, they'd take me away in a paddy wagon. Uh, but uh, chanting Krishna's name, if we're chanting with the idea to reach Krishna, we're trying to please Krishna with the chanting of his name, we chant with that mood, we will eventually overcome these various offenses. And when we overcome the offenses, we will see that Krishna is there in his name. It's a window into the spiritual world. And from Nam, we get Rup, and from Rup, we get Goon, and from Goon, we finally get what we call Leela. So the chanting of Krishna's name leads us to be able to see Krishna's form, which brings us farther to where we not only see his form, but we can appreciate the guna or the uh, qualities of Krishna. And finally, we get introduced into Krishna Leela, which is the final stage. So each of these is a progressive installment on what the holy name actually allows a person to do. So this chanting is actually leading us forward to connect with the spiritual world. <coughs> and uh, to connect with the spiritual world, we have to understand that the holy name cannot be confused with uh, some kind of uh, mundane subha karma. So, in this uh, Harinam Shantamani, Haridas Thakur then talks about the uh, what we usually call the eleventh offense, which is to um, be inattentive, which technically in Sanskrit is called pramada, inattention. We chant and we're distracted. And inattention has three flavors, audosina, vikshepa, and jadya. So, Haridas Thakur doesn't actually explain what Adosina is, and I tried to look it up in the Monier Williams Dictionary. It doesn't seem to be in there either. But Jadya is lethargy or uh, sloth. So we may notice when we chant the holy name, we get sleepy right away. Uh, this is not an accident, and nor is this something that is just us or something that happens once in a while. This is built into the universe that uh, when we try to chant Krishna's name, uh, if we are predominated by the mode of ignorance, we will find ourselves sleepy when we try to chant. It's very difficult to chant unless you're actually getting the taste for Krishna's name. And to get the taste for Krishna's name, you have to be free from offenses, you have to be free from Hridaya Dorbolium, you have to be free from Sat Krishna. So we're not at that stage. And instead when we chant, we are chanting to some extent offensively, to some extent inattentively. And therefore, we will naturally sometimes, not even sometimes, many times, feel sleepy when we try to chant. And this means that the mode of ignorance is trying to take us over. The mode of ignorance is happening. Uh, we find out 
<coughs> in the Madhurya Kadambani that um, when people come in contact with Krishna consciousness, we find some things are naturally attractive, like taking prasadam. You know, people uh, rarely do devotees fall asleep taking prasadam. I don't think I've ever seen that happen. <laughs> I don't believe I've ever seen that happen. Um, but then, kirtan. So, uh, again, usually in kirtan, I don't find very often devotees fall asleep in kirtan. It does happen. Uh, but uh, when we talk about japa, or we talk about actual hearing Krishna kata discourse about Krishna consciousness, immediately sleep creeps in there. Uh, so that's because the material energy is testing us that uh, we have so much mode of ignorance, we have so many offenses still, we have so much thirsting for material things. This mode of ignorance captures us. So if we find when we're trying to chant that we are becoming sleepy, uh, the best thing is to just get up and walk. Because uh, uh, if you're so sleepy that you're falling asleep while you're walking, then you probably should just go to sleep. You know, uh, that's pretty serious. Um, and that's what I do. That's why I generally never chant sitting down. I always chant walking because I don't want to waste time nodding out. We used to call that dive bombing chanting, where you go, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. We've all seen it. <laughs> we call that dive bombing chanting. You know, this is the tendency to fall asleep. And in the Harinam Chintamani, this is called jadya lethargy. We are overcome by uh, sloth, by uh, the mode of ignorance. The other thing is vikshepa. That's when the mode of passion overcomes you. You're not going to sleep. Your mind is whirling around all over the universe, uh, thinking what I have to do, what I should do, what I want to do, what I did do, what I didn't like somebody else did, and all these kinds of things. Our mind is checking out everything else except for the holy name. This is vikshepa, distraction. So both these things are uh, types of pramada or inattention. Uh, the reason we are distracted is because we still have so many material desires and when we're trying to chant we think that we just want to get our 16 rounds over with so that we can get on to the real business of satisfying our material desires. <laughs> now, of course this is embarrassing and you know I, I don't know how many times I do this too I am just trying to get myself out of this habit of thinking that you know I just want to get my 16 rounds over so that I can do whatever else I need to do or whatever it is you know which shows that we are not actually ready to immerse ourselves in the holy name we are thinking about just doing something in a ritualistic way to get it out of the way so we can move on to the next thing. And so this is vikshepa. And this offense of pramada or inattention is called the mother of all the other offenses. So if we are chanting consistently in an inattentive way, then what we will find is that our material desires, instead of shrinking, will begin to grow and we will become more and more kind of, uh, what's the right word, restless with the holy name and we will find ourselves scarcely able even to do it. We will want to be doing something else. So this is um, an important thing to realize that these offenses are there <coughs> And this is not something new that came around in the year 2013, but this has been going on since the beginning of time. The tendency to chant and fall asleep, the tendency to chant and have the mind wander, the tendency to be preoccupied with other things while we're chanting, the tendency to um, chant 
inattentively. Of course, I always make this disclaimer that whatever we're doing, however we're chanting, we still have to continue to chant. You will never get better at chanting by stopping chanting. That's, uh, that's definitely a step in the wrong direction, no matter how bad your chanting is or how wildly you are spacing out or sleeping or whatever it is. But uh, you have to uh, continue to chant and recognize what you're doing wrong and work at trying to rectify that uh, wrong way of doing things. So, <clears throat> Bhaktivinoda Thakur in the Harinam Chintamani mentions that one can chant uh, preferably with those devotees who have a great taste for chanting the holy name and look at them, try to understand how they're chanting, the mood in which they chant, and get a sense of how to emulate their way of doing it, especially when we see people are very sincere in their method of chanting. Also, Bhaktivinoda Thakur um, describes in this Harinam Chintamani that one can go into a dark room and put a cloth over the head and just try to chant that way. Or <coughs> one can... Um, try these kind of methods. Of course, associating with devotees is a very important thing. If we are thinking that the holy name is the same thing as Shubha Karma or one of these uh, secondary processes, the remedy is to go and find out, this is what Haridas Thakur says in the Harinam Shantamani, find a low caste Vaishnava and touch his feet, take the uh, dust from his feet, take prasadam remnants that have been uh, given to him. In this way, one will not think of oneself in some high uh, consciousness, but rather think oneself as very low, because one is um, trying to get the mercy even of what one might consider from a Vedic perspective, someone who is not very high in the caste system. And in this way, one can then, through trying to get the mercy of a genuine Vaishnava who appears to be not very uh, high in the Varnashram system, then one can be humbled and appreciate the holy name. So the holy name requires a person to be humble. And if we want to chant the holy name properly, we have to chant with humility. Uh, so these are... Uh, the, what we usually call the eighth offense, which is considering the glories of the holy name to be the same as the auspicious ritualistic activities offered in the Vedas as fruit of activity, karma, kanda. And number 11, which is uh, to be inattentive while chanting. We've discussed uh, the eighth offense and the eleventh offense. So I'm going to stop here. Any questions about these ten offenses? Yes. First you're going to defer to Matuna, okay. I want to say something about, um, <coughs> when you're talking about um, distraction and chanting, that I find that uh, when, when we place the soul emphasis on taste, when we what? Place the, the soul emphasis on taste and chanting, yeah. I find that um, there could be a problem, and I think one solution is also to try to place some emphasis on meaningfulness. Yeah. To try to be conscious of what we actually do and that we are chanting to shrink here. Even though we are not getting the taste, yeah. it's not a criteria for Well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be chanting to get the taste. We should right. be chanting the, the, to please Krishna. That's a very different thing. Right. So we will get a taste, but only when we're purified enough that Krishna decides to give it to us. Otherwise, it's a struggle. <laughs> Yeah. This is actually my worship, my relationship with Krishna. And I should go ahead and do it, regardless of however I may be feeling. I mean, so many things. 
Yeah. So, so if we had to chant the holy name five times every day, we could probably really focus down and chant it five times every day. The problem is we're chanting it two or three hours every day, and that's every day. So something that you do every day, generally, we see that if we brush our teeth every day, if we get up and we put on our shoes every day, if we wash our clothes every day, we get very automatic with the way we do what we call uh, routines every day. So that's what, what we're fighting against. We are doing something a lot, so it's a common activity, something we're doing quite frequently. And at the same time, we have not gotten to the stage where we have genuine taste in the Holy Name, which would right away blow away distractions. It would blow it all out of the water. We would not fall asleep, we would not be distracted if we had genuine taste or ruchi with the holy name. But that doesn't come until we fight our way through, you know, on our hands and knees crawling on our belly under barbed wire over, you know, crossfire. You know, we have to fight our way through all these levels <coughs> of, as we were saying, these clouds of anartas. Material desires, hridaya dorbolium, or uh, weakness of heart, the tendency to commit sinful activities and get completely distracted from Krishna. And of course these various ten offenses. So it's a struggle, uh, particularly the offense of pramada, which is the, as we were saying, the mother of all the offenses, to chant but actually have something else going on in our mind. And we catch ourselves moment after moment, time after time. The more we catch ourselves and the more we drag ourselves back to chanting the holy name. I have personally experienced <coughs> that the more struggle you go through in chanting your holy name, you really feel like you did something when you finished chanting, and you feel that your consciousness is substantially different than it was before. If you float through your japa, in other words, you know, you're chanting and the mind is tick, tick, ticking through, you know, all, you know, uh, uh, ships and sails and sealing wax, cabbages and kings, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, we, um, we find that we don't feel after the chanting that much has happened because essentially we have not done the real work. So instead of looking for a taste in the chanting, we're actually looking to try to grapple with our mental tendency to float off and to basically visit our own material desires moment after moment. You know, we have the things that went wrong, we're visiting the things we have issues with, we're visiting the things we want, we're visiting the things we plan to do. These are the things we're visiting when we actually should be hearing the Holy Name. So, uh, that's uh, uh, the method and um, if you struggle, then you feel that you're trying to please Krishna and you actually have, to some extent, grappled with the mind. Because the mind will certainly not lay down and play dead when you try to chant. The mind will throw every conceivable trick in the book to get you off of chanting the holy name. And uh, so when you chant the holy name, you have to kind of understand <clears throat> that the minute you sit down to try to chant, your mind is determined not to let you chant. Um, it's conditioned that way, and if we keep fighting the mind, eventually the mind will become our friend, it will be tamed, Maya will say, all right, all right, you've wrestled with the mind long enough, now the mind will actually get a taste for chanting. But don't expect it to happen next Thursday. You had a question too, uh, uh, Russ. I was, I was going to ask you what, uh, what, what, we, uh, what kind of frame of mind we should have, or um, what kind of what? Like frame of mind. Frame of mind, and, right? And or like, what should we think when we are chanting? Right. That's what I was asking. But you are saying like you're not supposed to think anything. Right. You're supposed to just hear the holy name. 
And of course we find out not only are you hearing the holy name, but you have a mood. And that mood is calling out for Krishna like a baby calls out for its mother. So that's what we hear about the holy name. And of course to get that mood <coughs> and to consistently be in the right frame of mind, we have to be trunadopi suniche na tarori vasahishnu na amanina manadena kirtaniya sadahari more humble than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree, offering all respects to others and not expecting any respect in return. This is the mantra that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said one should wear around their neck. If you have that mood, then you will also have the mood of calling out for Krishna like a child cries out for the mother, and you will find <coughs> that the control of the mind will be easier and easier. But basically, we are not trying to artificially conjure up images of Krishna. We are not trying to engage in some mental polemics. You know, we're not fighting some <coughs> um, philosophical war in our mind. We are just trying to hear Krishna's name. And all this stuff that tries to come in the mind, we can just see it and just let it go. We can drop it mid-sentence. We don't have to go through the whole thing. The mind is just this usual um, dialogue we have with ourselves. We start a sentence and the mind thinks of something that ends the sentence <clears throat> and then we trail on to maybe a related subject, sometimes maybe not a related subject, or at least it's not obviously related in some way. In this way, it's called stream of consciousness. We go from one idea to another and usually it's a a whole smorgasbord of things we want, things we hate, things that happen, things we see the future as being, and things that happened in the past that we are, you know, hashing over again. So this is what we're trying not to do while we chant. Yeah. Um, walking yeah. Um, is it not it is if you don't fall asleep. That, that I can't say for myself. It is better. Yeah, it's better to sit. Uh, one can be more meditative if he sits. But it never works for me, so I gave up. <laughs> I really hate that feeling because... For some reason, once you start with jadya, you start nodding out while you chant, sometimes 30 minutes, 45 minutes go by before you recognize that you can't stay awake. And uh, once you're really nodding, then your whole way of making decisions and your way of recognizing things is all soggy. So you, you don't come to any conclusion about it. You just continue to nod out. But if you're walking, that never happens, <laughs> at least for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, everybody has that. Even when you walk, you have that. That's less. Somehow, somehow it's less. What when is? I'm walking, it gets less. It gets less, huh? If I'm just sitting down, then it's like... Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on I might not fall or something. Yeah. <laughs> Usually walking is pretty automatic, almost. So. How is the holy dust cut that? What's that? What, how is what? How, what about Hari Dasa? How he did it. How he did it. He sat in one place around a Tulsi plant. Yeah. The time. yeah. He would sit. Uh, well, it says that uh, he chanted these 300 lakhs every day. You know. He sit down so he would, he would sit down, but uh, he would uh, chant um, one third of them. In other words, 100 lakhs. He would chant at the top of his lungs, and then 100 lakhs, he would chant normal tone of voice, and then 100 lakhs, he would chant silently in his mind. That's how he did. So if you're chanting 300 lakhs a day, you can chant in your mind, but otherwise Prabhupada didn't recommend it. <laughs> we don't chant anywhere near 300 lakhs every day. <laughs> yes? Uh, whenever I'm chanting, I like to sit, well, I do not like to be bothered right here, but you sit in one place, uh -huh. not talking to anybody, 
you, for example, I see a lot when you're chanting, you're having a conversation, and you stop the chant. Yeah, if yeah. If I'm chanting, when I'm going by one realm, I should not be bothering, I will not speak to anybody, I just go one corner, and I think when I'm finished, I will speak to whoever I have to talk to. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not sure if that's the wrong way or right way, I'm not sure. What well, that's doing. what they mention in the Haridas, Haridas Thakur mentions in the... Um, Harinam Chintamani, that one should try to find a secluded place to chant, or better, to chant with those who are also chanting and, and understand that chanting means chanting, you know, <laughs> not chanting and other things, you know. Um, we live in an unideal world and sometimes, you know, people intrude, sometimes things happen, and so on and so forth, but uh, ideally we should uh, chant when we're not being, uh, you know, attacked by distracting other people or other kinds of things. That's why usually it's best to chant in the early part of the day. Generally speaking, at uh, uh, 3 a.m. or 4.30 in the morning, nobody's going to call you and nobody's going to be doing things. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, that's the way it's usually described, that, you know, when you're chanting and you're distracted, it's like calling somebody and ignoring them when they come, you know. Uh, uh, <coughs> no, I'm not going to have anything. This is Utsab, is that his name? Yeah. Utsab, okay. Where did Usha go? She's, she, went, she went home? Was that? Like some people, they have problem concentrating on anything. Yeah. It's like they have a genuine problem. That's that's uh, like kind of the way or most or people are in the age of Kali Yuga. Like some people have like ADD or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They even worse. Like, you know. Yeah. But Krishna recognizes that you are you are you are you are struggling. Yeah. Krishna recognizes. Right. So wherever we are, I always think of it. If progress in devotional service is measured by the alphabet, like you start off at A and then you go to B, C, D, and finally you wind up at Z, which is Krishna Loka, then if you're at C, the only thing you can do is go to D, you know, you've got to go to D. You know, if you're at already at F, then you can go to G, you know. So uh, everybody is somewhere and they have to go the next step. If you're progressive about wherever you are, you're going to the next step, then Krishna will always help you. If you try to go and skip steps, then you'll have a problem. If you try to remain in the same step or go back one step, then you'll have a problem. You know. I think, um, yeah, but we did not talk about he was saying, like, don't stay in one place for a long time or one stage for a long time or 
or try to go fast. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, that's when a person gets to a higher stage of chanting. We actually feel a connection to Krishna, and Krishna may even communicate with you. That's all in the higher stages of chanting. And we may actually even get glimpses of that in the early stages of chanting.